Monday Night Football intros, when done right, are some of the best in all of sports television. There's something incredible about hearing the iconic theme music and Hank Williams Jr. singing about the game you're about to watch. And in their heyday, when they added elements of pop culture and celebrities and whatnot, they were amazing, and they still hold up to this day. Especially in the 90s, ABC knew how to get you ready for some football. When done right, these intros are amazing. But when done wrong, not so much. When you've been on the air for 50 years, you're bound to make some missteps along the way. There was a time where Hank Williams Jr. got fired, and so for a few years, ESPN had no idea what they were doing with the intro, making it the most bland vanilla thing out there, paling in comparison to Sunday Night Football on NBC. There was a time where they brought Hank Williams Jr. back, but they added Jason Derulo and Florida Georgia Line alongside him. That was fun. But perhaps no intro was as polarizing, as bad, and as controversial as what transpired in 2004. An intro so bad that thousands of letters were written to the FCC. An intro so bad that ABC issued an immediate apology afterwards. An intro so bad that some deemed it to be racist and sexist. An intro so bad that it backfired in absolutely spectacular fashion. This is the story of the worst moment in Monday Night Football history. Before we dive into the promo, we need some context. Scratch that. We need a lot of context. Because a lot was going on here around this time. The year is 2004, and the landscape of television, and maybe all of entertainment, has completely shifted because of what happened at Super Bowl 38 earlier in February. While the New England Patriots won their second title in three years over the Carolina Panthers in what was a very exciting game, that wasn't the talk of the town. Rather, the talk was about what happened at the halftime show. At the end of the chaotic mess of a show starring Jessica Simpson, the University of Houston marching band, Kid Rock, P. Diddy, and Nelly, Janet Jackson joined Justin Timberlake on stage to perform Rock Your Body. In the final line of the song, Timberlake proclaims, I'm going to have you naked by the end of this song. And unfortunately for the NFL and the FCC, Timberlake was true to his word. This moment marked a turning point in entertainment. Janet Jackson overnight went from one of the biggest female pop stars of all time to her career being torpedoed. Sports, including Monday Night Football, began airing things on a 5-7 to seven second delay to try and prevent anything like this from ever happening again. The FCC handed CBS a fine worth over half a million dollars, which was the largest fine ever at the time. MTV, which produced the halftime show as well as the Super Bowl 35 halftime show, was banned from ever doing another halftime show again. It started a period where for six years, the NFL went with classic rock artists that wouldn't have any controversy on paper. The league went with the safest possible choice ever at Super Bowl 39 by having Paul McCartney play the show. After Super Bowl 38, good luck trying anything risque on over-the-air television. That half second in front of the entire country watching the game was enough to change the entertainment landscape in more ways than one. Keep all of this in the back of your mind when you watch the promo, because next we have to take a look at Monday Night Football and talk about ABC. I made a video a while ago about the creation of Monday Night Football and how ABC got the rights to it if you want to check that out in the upper right corner. This was seen as a gamble, but a necessary one for ABC, since their primetime lineup in the late 60s was so bad, and they were getting trashed in the ratings compared to CBS and NBC. By airing Monday Night Football, ABC's ratings in the 70s began to skyrocket. But in the decade leading up to this 2004 moment, ratings were on the decline. ABC tried a bunch of tricks to get the ratings back, including adding comedian Dennis Miller into the booth in 2000. That didn't go so well. After Pat Summerall retired in 2002, ABC poached John Madden away from Fox and threw him into the booth with Al Michaels. The ratings decline stopped after that, but they still were not what they used to be. Here's some examples showing how dire ABC's situation was. On October 31st, 1994, Halloween night, they aired a Monday Night Football game between the Green Bay Packers and the Chicago Bears. It was an awful game, with Green Bay winning 33-6, but it still had the highest ratings of the night. Even though the lead-in programs of Coach and Blue Skies had the smallest ratings of the Big Four networks, with Blue Skies at 8.30 only pulling a not-so-nice 6.9, Monday Night Football pulled a 17 immediately afterwards. Ten years later, on November 1, 2004, they aired a Monday Night Football game between the New York Jets and the Miami Dolphins. 
Not only did ABC not have the highest ratings at the 9 o'clock time slot, but they lost to a rerun of Everybody Loves Raymond. Not a new episode, a rerun. I took a look at the ratings every year from 1994 to 2003, just to illustrate this 10-year decline that ABC was facing with their marquee program. They go down every year from 1994 to 2001, and then they level off in 2002 after John Madden signed on. You can blame a lot of reasons for the decline. The quality of the product going down with poor choices in the booth. The decline of TV ratings in general over this time period, as the market became more saturated. The fact that NFL Sunday Ticket was created in 1994 could also have something to do with it. Whereas Monday Night Football was one of the only ways to watch teams out of your market beforehand, you can now watch any team you wanted to every single week. The lack of star power after all the quarterbacks of the previous generation, like Dan Marino, Troy Aikman, Steve Young, and John Elway, were gone. There's a whole bunch of reasons you can blame the ratings for going down. But the problem is that there didn't seem to be an easy fix. The quality of the booth being blamed for the ratings doesn't explain why the ratings didn't go back up after they hired John Madden, arguably the best color commentator of all time, to be paired alongside the legend himself, Al Michaels. The oversaturation of television with hundreds of cable channels now in competition doesn't explain why, especially in the age of TiVo and DVR, they lost in the ratings to a rerun of Everybody Loves Raymond. Whatever the case may be, things took a turn for the worse in 2004. In the eight weeks leading up to what we're about to witness, the ratings were a 10.9. This was shockingly low. One game between the St. Louis Rams and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers drew a 7.7 .7 rating as ABC finished behind both Fox and CBS that night in the ratings for that time slot. With the future of Monday Night Football already in doubt, these numbers were not helping. ABC was noticing this, and they were not happy. They needed to find a way to get the ratings back on the upswing. Fortunately, ABC had a program that was doing well and was showing no signs of slowing down. They had a golden goose. And that's when they hatched an idea. Oh yes, we're going there. ABC had been struggling, as by the end of the 2003-04 season, they were the network in last place out of the Big Four. Monday Night Football was the only program they had that was inside the top 10 of the Nielsen ratings. Besides that, The Bachelor was the only other program they had inside the top 31. I say top 31 because it was a tie for 30th. ABC had just two of the top 31 shows in the country across the Big Four networks. For perspective, CBS and NBC led the way with 13 each, Fox was in third place with three, but that doesn't count the NFL games that they aired every Sunday during the fall, and doesn't really take into account the fact that American Idol was a cultural juggernaut. Nothing ABC tried seemed to be working. Especially after the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire bubble burst, nothing was going right for them. They tried promoting Alias after Super Bowl 37. That did nothing to their ratings. ABC aired 12 new series for the 2003-04 season. By the end of the season, 10 of them got cancelled. This is a network that was a distant fourth in the Big Four, and their marquee program of Monday Night Football was seemingly dying. But then, everything changed in 2004-05. ABC revamped their entire lineup, and it worked. This was the season where seemingly everything ABC touched turned to gold. Grey's Anatomy premiered that season, as did Dancing with the Stars. You had long-running shows like Boston Legal, Super Nanny, and Wife Swap. And of course, you had Desperate Housewives. This show was pulling a 14.5 rating on average on Sunday nights. It was the highest rated new show in the ratings by a relatively large margin. And if you combine both nights that American Idol was airing, this was the third highest rated show of the season, only behind Idol and CSI Crime Scene Investigation. For the first time in what felt like forever, ABC had found their audience. And so, ABC executives came up with an idea. They had a program that was big right off the bat, and was almost somewhat of a cultural phenomenon. They had a program that was on the decline, had been for years, and was in serious need of an audience. Monday Night Football had a game draw of 7.7 .7 that year, which in the 35-year history of the program was the lowest-rated game of all time. Both Desperate Housewives and Monday Night Football attracted completely different audiences. What if we got some cross-promotion? Cross-promotion has been a tactic of television networks used whenever they want to promote a show. Integrate it into another show, get both audiences, and you may be able to get some people who never watched the show to stay on board. 
Fox did it with The Simpsons and The Critic. Nickelodeon did it with a lot of their game shows, as well as with Fairly Odd Parents and Jimmy Neutron. Cross promotion, when done right, can work well. So that's exactly what ABC tried to do. They tapped into the Desperate Housewives audience. They got the most polarizing player in football at the time in Terrell Owens. And they put America's team against the team that had made it to three consecutive NFC championships in one of the most heated rivalries in pro football. Now we've got the context. We now know that any sort of nudity on television, especially in the wake of the Janet Jackson controversy at the Super Bowl, is frowned upon. We know that Monday Night Football is in serious decline and needs a boost. We know that after years and years of trying, ABC finally found ratings gold in their new show, Desperate Housewives. And we know that combining these two shows through cross-promotion could be a good way to get people exposed to both programs and give Monday Night Football a much-needed lift. And now, with all that being said, it's time to show the intro. Here we go. Amy! Hey there, Carol. What are you doing here? Oh, my house burned down. And I needed to take a long, hot shower. So where are you off to? Looking so pretty. Baby, it's Monday Night Football. Game starts in ten minutes. <laughs> you and your little games. I've got a game we can play. Hey, this is Major. We've got Parcells and the Cowboys. And Donovan needs me. Well, what about my needs? What about Edie? Will you stop it? All of Philadelphia is counting on me. Well, I can't help myself. I love you, T.O. Then how about you tell me what's buried underneath that pool? You know I can't tell you that. Then I got a game to play. Terrell, wait. Oh, hell. Team's gonna have to win this one without me. Oh, my God. Who watches this trash? Sex, lies, betrayal. And that woman is just so desperate. <laughs> I know what you should watch. Are you ready for some football? Look, sometimes you have good ideas, and you really thought about all the possibilities and planned it all out, but it just doesn't work. Either something was off in the execution, or you misjudged how your audience would react to it. Stuff like this happens. Everybody makes mistakes when they think they're doing their best and doing what's right. But here, especially in the aftermath of the Janet Jackson incident a few months prior, did none of the higher-ups at ABC think for five seconds that, hey, showing self-core porn before a football game on broadcast television might not be the best idea. Anyone? Not even the original XFL stooped that low. And trust me, they stooped really low at times. As anyone with a brain can expect, the reaction to this intro was really, really bad. And I mean really bad. The day after, ABC put out a statement saying that this segment was inappropriate. The Eagles were not too happy that their star receiver was featured here, saying after seeing the final piece, we wish it hadn't aired. Naturally, the NFL was furious at this, saying that while ABC may have gained attention for one of its other shows, the NFL and its fans lost. And to the shock of no one, the FCC was furious at this, with Chairman Michael Powell saying, I wonder if Walt Disney would be proud. Colts head coach Tony Dungy had some strong words about the ad, saying that it was racially insensitive and that if this is what we have to do to get ratings, I'd rather not get them. I realize that ratings pay us in this league, but if that's what we have to do, I'm willing to take a pay cut. Bears head coach Lovey Smith called the skit pretty close to pornographic. Steelers owner Dan Rooney said that the opening was out of place and should not have been a part of the broadcast. I thought it was disgraceful. Arizona Senator and future presidential candidate John McCain said that this was a disgraceful performance. Roughly 50,000 letters were written to the FCC about this ad. For comparison, one year prior in September 2003, there were roughly 5,500 letters complaining about programming indecency and obscenity in radio and television broadcasting. That was over the course of a month. This one 90-second promo got roughly 10 times that total. 
but the end game for this was the ratings. Did the ratings go up? Did the cross promotion work as intended? Let's find out. Starting with Desperate Housewives, in light of the controversy, the ratings actually went down. The episode that aired before this, titled Running to Stand Still, got 24.6 million viewers. The episode that aired after this, titled Anything You Can Do, got 24.21 million viewers. So that didn't work. Unsurprisingly, football fans aren't going to watch Desperate Housewives when Sunday Night Football is airing at the exact same time on ESPN. But to be fair to ABC, this cross-promotion wasn't really done for that show. It was done for Monday Night Football. It was done to try and revive their dying product. So let's look at the Monday Night Football ratings. The Cowboys-Eagles game where this promo aired drew an 11.6 rating. The following week, the New England Patriots, who were the defending Super Bowl champions and had won two of the past three titles, played the Kansas City Chiefs. The ratings actually decreased to a 10.6. The following week in a Packers-Rams game, it was 11.5. Then in Cowboys-Seahawks, it was 10.9. Ratings aren't available for the Chiefs-Titans game that took place after that, but total viewership is. And seeing as the viewership dropped from 16.6 million to 13.8 million, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the rating was worse. This was followed by an 11 rating in the Dolphins-Patriots game, and a 10.5 rating in the Rams-Eagles game to close off the season. So as it turns out, the ratings actually went down after this cross-promotion stunt backfired. The average rating from before the stunt and after the stunt was exactly the same. Not only was this promo controversial in many ways, but it didn't even work as intended on either side of the coin. Everything about this stunt backfired. It was universally panned and criticized. When you're on the air for 50 years, you're bound to make mistakes. We had Dennis Miller in a booth. We had Tony Kornheiser in a booth. We had Jason Witten in a booth. And heck, Booger McFarlane was working games for two years. But I'm not sure any mistake was as big as this one. So if you're a television executive and you're looking to get the rights to NFL games when the TV contracts expire, just a heads up. Don't air softcore porn before a game. It's going to backfire on you. Special thanks to all our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a Patreon and request future video topics in the description below.